Well, I didn't put the podcast up last night because I had such a busy week. And yesterday was Good Friday. It was Good Friday the, the week before in the Western Christian tradition. But the one that I like is the Orthodox. And that was yesterday. What they call Great Friday. And Great Friday is followed by Holy Saturday. And I woke up this morning and I said to myself, Holy God, it's Holy Saturday. And I didn't do the podcast yesterday. Well, I was busy during the week. I had some personal social events to attend to. And that that resulted in me being in the a hotel in Cavan, the Farnham Estate Hotel. I love the Farnham Estate Hotel. This is no way in any way promoting it. But you see, I grew up very close to it. Uh, on the borders of Cavan Town. It was only about 10 minutes on the bicycle out to Farnham Estate, as we used to call it. And it was on the way to Killikeen, it was on the way to Loch All the places of the air and the, the little rivers and inlets and little kind of lake areas on the river. And we'd go out there and we'd fish. And I used to love going out fishing there. And I used to fish kind of on my own. I didn't like... You know, when there'd be a gang of lads fishing, I got uneasy. And I've always been uneasy in the company of men when there's a sort of spontaneity that's very, very male orientated. I think that maybe is what singles out males to be, let's say, writers or monks. I think those two vocations in, in general are kind of similar. And um, sometimes it's it's not necessarily a talent that opens you into a life as a writer or a life as some kind of monastic. Sometimes it's it's your own disability. Do you know what I mean? Your own inability to communicate with other people allows you to spend more time in your own. You spend more time in your own and you begin to sense the sense of the otherness, the sacredness, the, the kind of real presence that is in nature. And that's what I would have got when I'd be fishing out in Killikeen. A lovely sense of just the richness of, you know, the still water and birds. There might be cranes or, or, or crows or various birds would be kind of floating over in the sky above you. And you'd hear their wings moving, you know, a kind of a, an aching sound, almost like stretching a bone sometimes when a large bird is flying be very beautiful and I'd be sitting there and I'd be looking at the lake and thinking I better start the fishing now any minute we used to have in those days kind of reels the reel was for reeling in the fish and it was a kind of a very high tech sort of thing it wasn't you wouldn't be pulling the the string with your hand it kind of spun around you could reel it in very quick and you put a you put a, a bait on the end of it but it was like a metal bait and it looked like a little fish with two or three huge big hooks at the back of it. And you just threw it out and then you you reeled it in and threw it out and reeled it in and threw it out and reeled it in. And everybody would have different theories as to which baits worked well. We'd go to Johnny Donoghue's shop in Calvin in, in Bridge Street and we'd buy Voblex. I remember that name, V-O-B-L-E-X. Voblex, and there was a number on it. I think it was like you could get a, a Voblex 2 or a Voblex 5 or a Vob, Voblex 4 or whatever. And that was, and it was just like a kind of a very crude wire thing with a thing at the top looked like the head of a fish, a thing in the middle that looked like the belly. Very often the belly bit was sort of like a spoon, so it would spin in the water and probably catch the light and really draw the attention of the big pike. There was another little bait, it was called a flips, F-L-I-P-S. And again, as far as I remember, there was a flips one, two, three, four, five, that sort of thing. And you'd be in all sorts of confusion about which bait to use. And I, I've never, I never worked it out like, that a particular bait would be suitable for, you know, whether it was a cloudy sky or uh, a blue sky. I, I never figured it out. 
but you'd be always wondering sometimes you'd be there and you'd be you know throwing the voblex out and spinning it in or reeling it in and you'd be at that maybe for an hour or two hours and there might be some fella beside you and he'd he'd be really he might have caught three pike and five perch in the same time and you'd be looking to see what bait he was using and you might see that oh he's using a different bait there was another bait now there was a third bait and it wasn't silver in the way that the flips were silver and the voblex were silver in general that's they had a general look of silveriness but there was one it, it looked like copper it was a really simple thing it was just like a it was like a spoon the top of a spoon made of copper with the hooks at the end of it and those you'd look and you'd see a boy using that and he'd have caught three or four fish and you'd be thinking now that's the bait I should be using and you'd be even at that stage you see negative with yourself and you can see the way that I would be behaving I'd be isolated like I'd be working it out in my head rather than going over to the other young lad and saying, come here to me, what bait are you using? Will you give me a loan of it, can I? What do you think of the Voblex, you know? I'd be there kind of isolated. I wasn't able to break through linguistically with other kids. So I never found a sort of spontaneity with other boys in that sense. And it's funny that that kind of blockage can actually lead to you becoming more articulate on the inside so you begin to live with shaping the narrative imagining the conversations you begin to imagine the conversations you might have if you had the courage to go over and talk to the young lad and you might say why did i end up like that at such a young age being isolated and you might say it was to do with parents or socialization you know i remember there was a poem on the leaving certificate syllabus the the exam syllabus at the time when I was a teenager and the title of it was my parents kept me from children who were rough now I don't remember the content of the poem but I always remember that the phrase was an electric phrase for me there was something in the phrase it made me tingle made me feel like oh there's some truth about me in that phrase and I probably was living in a suburban area away from the town with elderly parents who themselves wouldn't have been master communicators with other parents in the school because there were maybe a, a, a ten year gap between them or in my father's case maybe a twenty year gap in between them, you know. So there was a sense of you can get isolated in a particular type of family. You can get isolated because socially, maybe you're you're just geographically on the edge of where everybody collects. Calvin Town was the place where all the young lads would collect. So that they had a life after school. They'd go home and do their homework and put in their school bags. And then they'd go out in town and they'd go up to Benny Maguire's. Benny Maguire's was a, a lovely little sweet shop and it was on Ash Street. Well, you'd go in there and... Benny used to sell cigarettes, if you don't mind, t teenager boys, young lads. You'd go in there for a single cigarette was three pence, threepence. And um, as far as I remember, ten Albany would have been like maybe two and sixpence. Two shillings and six pennies, and that was a lot of money in them days. But you'd go in, th there used to be... There was very, very country people from a place around Drummalee. Drummalee, Behi, Behi Bog, all those areas. And when they'd be coming into town of a Saturday night, and this is when now the, the church started to have masses, that started having the Sunday mass on a Saturday evening. So the people, men from Drummalee would come in, but it would be a full outing for them in the town they'd be on their bicycles and they'd do their shopping and they'd go to their mass and they'd go to Benny some of them anyway two or three of them and they'd be in there and they'd be standing around and some of them would be sitting on orange boxes smoking cigarettes and drinking minerals so it was like a bar without a license a non-alcoholic bar for drummily men going to mass if you don't mind and you'd wonder why drummily people 
came in. You say, well, what did, why did rural people come into the town, to the cathedral? Well, the answer is that they were part of the parish because, again, in those days, the town wasn't as big, wasn't as vast. So now, if you lived in the country, you'd have to, you know, you'd, ha- you'd have to get a bus into town nearly. But in those days, the town itself, which was very much a town and had been for three or four hundred years, it was a distinguished town, even in the 17th century, with a beautiful monastery that had been there since the 12th century, you know. But all you had to do was go round a couple of corners and you were in the country. In fact, even where we lived, even where we lived on Farnham Road at the time, and it's a very built-up area now with, with fancy houses all sprawled around the place, it's total built-up suburbia. But in our time, when you went out our front gate, you were looking at a field. A big field with big ditches. We used to call it the dump because people used to dump rubbish in there. Funny day. Like, it was a different world. But anyway, I'm saying we'd go into Benny Maguire's off a of Saturday and you might buy a cigarette and you'd, you'd stay there with the men and you'd try and smoke it and drink your Fanta orange like with maturity, pretending that you were a big fella. But I'm not saying that all the kids in the town used to smoke in Benny Maguire's, but I'm saying that was an example of how there was a social life in the town, so that when young boys in primary school or in secondary school went home in the evenings and they threw in their school bag and they, you know, finished their homework by just looking at the bag for five minutes, they went out then and they met each other and they had a social life. When you were living in suburbia, even though it was walkable, it was about a mile outside the town, you were, you were living in a different world. It was like you went back into the wilderness of the country. And so there's all sorts of reasons why a young lad like me might grow up in my teenage years and not be kind of spontaneous, not be socialising much with other people. But that, that I, I really think that's what caused me to end up um, wanting to be a writer from the time I was 14. From the time I was 14, I had, I had written poems and sent them to the Junior Digest and I had badgered my uncle Oliver to get me a typewriter. He did, a lovely old black manual typewriter which I kept and cherished for many years and I disposed of it about two years ago because I just got fed up with the amount of junk I was carrying through my life. And I I had this moment where I suppose it was because of illness too and I was thinking, you know, the shortness of life is short. It's very short. And something like this, carrying baggage, carrying boxes of old files and old bits of sentimental furniture, all the rest of it, that you gather this around you and it ends up in a garage or it ends up in a shed. Now, in actual fact, it ended up, all this stuff that I was carrying all my life, it ended up in my studio shed in Leitrim. And I thought, you know, it's just cluttering the place. I just have to... I have to step into old age in a wiser and a freer way. And that is to understand now that life is passing, life is transient, and you don't need to be holding on to stuff like your life was a museum and that it's some sort of eternal monument to what happened to you. So I disposed of an awful lot of stuff there about two years ago, and including the typewriter. But anyway, that was a typewriter that my uncle gave to me, and I was very, very happy with it, and that too made me a writer because I learned at that stage that to be a writer is a craft. It's the same as making furniture. It's the same as as shaping anything. You be a writer, you have to get the tools of your trade, and then you have to learn the trade. I'm still doing that, but I think that the socialisation process, the way that you're brought up, sometimes, sometimes the the kind of the things that you see as false or disabling in your youth can very often be the door into the beautiful life. And this is like what Rumi, I suppose, says. You know, it's 
It's the wound is where the light comes in. Now, you wouldn't say this was a wound. You know, being a young lad who was isolated, who was the son of elderly parents, who didn't in themselves score high as communicators, and being a young lad who was living outside the town, who didn't score well with, you know, the spontaneity that young boys have, I never played football. I never went out on a pitch except once and I was so stupid and so much in a daze and in a dream that after about ten minutes the trainer shouted at me, go home Harding. Go home. So I went home and I never went back. But, And I was glad I didn't in one sense because I didn't want to be forced into those situations of group think or you know, group behaviour. Men can be lovely, you know, when they're working as a team. Young lads there in a football match, God, it's beautiful to watch them. The way that they, they almost kind of like think collectively. You know, you can see the, the, the group of them on, on the playing field and the way the ball passes. It's like, it's like they have a big collective mind of consciousness. It's very beautiful. And maybe it is a display of group consciousness. Maybe that's why... Maybe that's why they say that, it, you know, in Kerry, for example, they say it's like a religion. Football is like a religion because in some sense it manifests the invisible. It manifests collective consciousness. I don't mean the collective unconsciousness, but I mean a, a kind of a very knowing, aware, awake presence which is not vested in one single player but actually seems to to be guiding all the players like like fingers of the one hand. That would be a fair description now of Kerry footballers on a good day. Well, I never went that road, but I think that when I went out to Killikeen and when I went out to all those beautiful areas, I fell in love with trees. I developed a relationship with trees that I have until this day, and I love trees. And I love to sit under the trees. And I love this time of year because we're oh, we're going into the most beautiful, beautiful moment. I think it is really my favourite moment in this time of summer and spring. It is, it's around the 1st of May. The leaf is not yet out on the beech tree. But the cherry trees, the wild cherry now I'm speaking of, the wild indigenous cherry trees, they have blossomed beautifully over the past three or four weeks. And the daffodils are over. And the white thorn has blossomed and been full and gone and we're waiting now, coming up to May, for the hawthorn, the May bush. And I think that's the moment when all the leaves, from the chestnut to the beech, they all are finally out. But they're still, the leaves are still like, do you know they're juicy? The, the, the leaves are luminous. The green in it is luminous. You can see light coming through it. And they're, they're like, you feel that if you touched it, it would wet your finger and the leaf would disintegrate. It's that delicate. And those leaves will get, get harder and older as time goes on. They will become, they will become beautifully deep green and, and strong. But, but at the moment when they come, and they're just about coming now, they're not yet there in many places, the beech tree, but when they do, ah, listen, they unfold like a little little tight envelope loosening up. And out it comes, and it's like a plated, sometimes it's like a, a pleated skirt. Just, and then it loosens out. It's very, very amazing to watch it. And that makes this time of year so exciting. Well, I used to go out to the lakes. I used to go out to the rivers, the urn at that time of year. And I would be rejoicing in the fact that I was alive. And I stop myself because there's the first, there's the first thing. Rejoicing. I would be rejoicing. Do you know what that word is? I mean, do you feel the experience of rejoicing? You know, there's another word which is very close to it, and that's gratefulness. Gratefulness is like, it's, it's, it's referring to somebody else or some other thing, you know. 
Like like you say, I am grateful to you for being a patron to this podcast. And believe me, I am. I am really grateful. I feel, I feel an emotion of gratefulness to you. When I meet somebody who listens to the podcast, and I did meet a couple during the week, and a woman was passing me at the door of the hotel, and she just just was passing. She just kind of said offhand as she passed, "Love the podcasts," and uh, I felt grateful. I felt like, "Thank you, thank you so much." That's lovely. It really is. I, and gratefulness is like, you can feel it towards a person. You can, but you can you can develop it as well. You can nurture it, you know. Um, I'd I'd be afraid nearly to go into it because it's such a big and important and beautiful idea. Because if I think of my parents, like you or anybody else, there's loads of stuff I could say negatively about them, right? Because we're all human. And rearing children is not very easy. And and doing it in, in middle age or... You know, when you're 50 years of age, it could be pretty tricky. So you can find faults with with everybody. You could find faults with your with your teachers, and we all have nightmare stories about our childhood. You know, about our teachers, about people in authority, about clergy. Now I don't go there. I did. I wrote three plays. I wrote Unapuka, Misogynist and Sour Grapes to kind of meditate on those terrible clerical abuses that were done when when we were all young and growing up and being being kind of fooled, in a sense, by the institution that we believed in and let down by the institution. I've written about that and I've written about the troubles in the north. I've written about, you know, the blood in the fields of Fermanagh. Blood in the fields. Blood on the street. Looking at somebody with a scrubbing brush, washing the blood from the street, where a dead body had been taken away. I mean, th- there's a lot of darkness, surely, and there's a lot of darkness. Nobody has grown up without it. Nobody, you can't live through 20, 30, 40, 50 years without having been touched by darkness. But here's the point. There's another part of you, part of me, which is being held beautifully in the arms of the divinity, in the arms of the transcendent, eternal presence, the depth that exists in every moment, the music, the invisible behind the visible. This presence, which is with me now in this room, which is with you now in this room, or wherever you're walking, or wherever you're sitting, or driving. This presence. And I just go silent because I have nothing more to say when I just wonder when I just wonder, how is it that it is? How is it that I am here? How is it that that those two people, those implausible parents of mine, you know, how is it that they managed to physically connect quietly in a manner that was successful for pregnancy? and ended up delivering a baby and then gathering that baby up in its little swaddling and rearing it and teaching it English. And how how is it that I learned English so well as a child? Nobody taught me. I just picked it up, like they say, he licked it off the floor. How is it that I ended up as a teenager in somewhere that was peaceful, where I was well fed, but there was plenty of, well, there wasn't plenty of money. I mean, my father was always worried about it, especially when he retired, which he did when I was, like, young. When, when, 
like when I was a teenager, he had already retired from his job and his, his pension was one third in those days. It was just one third of his salary. So it wasn't so, so much. But we had we had beautiful food to eat and we had beautiful beds to sleep in and we had we had safety and shelter and there were no wild animals trying to eat us and there was no rats tormenting us at night and, and all the things that human beings suffer. So we were very lucky. No matter how we struggled. No matter what oppressed us, no matter what the fears were, we still we still weren't in danger of war happening. There was no there was no possibility ever that the roof of our house I mean it might it might lose a slate, but it certainly wasn't going to be shelled, as they say nowadays on the television. Shelling. I never thought of that word, you know, as much as I do now, since we began watching the war with Russia on our television screens every night. More shelling, they say. There was more shelling in Mariupol. And I think, wow, when we were young, we, we might have lost a slate off the roof, but nobody was shelling us. And, and this is a kind of a, a sense of gratefulness that comes over me. A gratefulness. A sort of a sense of thank you. Because I can bring this to the idea that there is a God. And you can bring it to the idea of, of whatever God you have. So the dynamic you have with God, let's say, is gratefulness. Thank God I'm alive. Thank God for my children. Thank God for my health. Sometimes when I was struggling with the health issue and all my old operations, in the past two years, I might have a good day and I might be able to go to the bathroom. Just go to the bathroom would be an achievement, a huge achievement, and, and afterwards I'd have a full day of almost kind of ecstasy because I'd be saying, well, thank God for that. Yeah? Because my body functioned in a way that was minimum like to requirements. So you can be grateful at different levels. And when you learn something as a young person, and again I'm grateful that I had that experience of solitude as a young person because it meant that when you learn something as a young person, it stays with you for life. And the solitude that I discovered in the woods of Killikeen and on the lake shore of Loch Erne and Killikeen, the solitude I discovered there has never left me. And it was a solitude that did not lead me to loneliness, but lead, led me to a sense of aloneness, peaceful quietude, just being here. Sometimes it's, mo it's at moments like that that you actually don't need to pray because you just don't need to pray because it's praying in you. It's it's like the presence is in you, and and you know you're conscious of the presence. There, it's beyond words what you're experiencing. It's beyond words. You you know the way that you get a lot of uh, mystics and and saints and and meditators in other in, in in huge areas of Buddhist tradition, and globally, and they all talk about this way of using using words and using concepts to draw us into the quietude where we find God or where we find the awakened mind but that but that there's always a threshold where you let go of words you let go of words and you, and you know it I mean you know it yourself you know it sometimes I do often describe it as like the gaze a mother might have at her little baby child in her arms and, and just for a second you see her and, and she's just looking and you know that she's completely conscious of the love in her body for her baby she's completely conscious of being present in the present moment as a dynamic of two she's, she's just swept up in love And every one of us 
feels that, I believe, when we're alone. And it's a, a very wonderful door to open. I mean, you see it in 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 children's writing, like C.S. Lewis. You know, a Narnia is this wonderful world which is inside the wardrobe. Go through the wardrobe and you go into another world. That sense of the invisible, that sense of depth in reality. Now, you grow up and I don't believe that Narnia is in the wardrobe anymore. In another way, I still do, actually. I still do, because the poetic language of that is is just stretching language as far as you can to say there is a mystery to being here which you can experience, and once you get into it, it's beyond words. And if you're a Buddhist, a Zen meditator, whatever, whatever your thing is for ritual, whatever your thing is for practice, whether, no matter what, side of the Christian tradition you come from, you know that there is this moment of silence. Jesus talks about it, you know, if you want to pray, go in to your heart, go into the room that's inside in your heart, close the door, and inside, in that room, you will experience God's presence. That's an amazing thing. You can feel gratefulness. But you can also feel rejoicing. And if you feel rejoicing, like like I'm overwhelmed as a teenage boy to be sitting under the trees, to be looking at the shimmering light. And by the way, what would happen to me in those situations, when I'd go out to fish and I have these big hooks, big ugly hooks, and I'm looking at everybody else and I did it. I did this myself. I'm going to confess something now. I'm going to confess something. When I was a young boy, there were occasions when I caught a big pike, and he'd be flapping and wriggling on the shoreline after I took him in, and I'd be trying to get the hook out of his mouth, and I wouldn't be thinking about whether that sentient being experienced any pain I would be just very rough in removing the hook from the poor little fish's mouth and then I would get a stick they used to have a name for this it was a kind of an iron metal thing apparently I don't know but I never seen one but you know professional fishermen at the time they would have had an iron metal bar and it was called the priest the priest, if you don't mind. And they'd give the poor fish a clatter of the priest on the back of the neck and it'd completely knock him out. Well, I'd be using a stone. And the grotesque violence that I could inflict on the poor animal was so appalling that it would nearly turn my stomach. And I confess that to you, because it's like none of us are clean, you know. None of us are pure. None of us have any cause to stand with the righteous and accuse everybody else of wrongdoing. The door into real peace is recognising your flaw me recognising my flaw. And that was one of them. And it used to deeply affect me, you know. I used to say to myself at the time, this is wrong. You might say, okay, it was only a fish, but it was serious enough. It was serious enough. And there was no reason for it. It's, it's 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 as if my karma had within it, or I contained within my karma as a human being, I contained anger and violence. And I don't care how you analyse it. But life is not just sitting under a tree rejoicing in the beauty of the sky. And life is not just wallowing around thanking God all the time for how lucky you are. No. 
sometimes real awakening is recognizing I have done something there which is wrong and it's me who has done it and I take ownership for it and I need someone to forgive me. It's such a huge, huge therapeutic thing I feel to find forgiveness. And then to let go, to let go of what it is that is the darkness in you and focus on what is beautiful. You know, to move on. So when I was young, that's what I did. I confess it. Now, I've I've mentioned there three huge ideas that for me existed as I evolved within the Christian tradition. And I look back on them and I name them rejoicing, rejoicing in the beauty of just being alive. I'm going to do it when this podcast is over. I'm going to go out and I'm going to walk on the beach. And I'm going to just rejoice in the waves, rejoice in the sound and the light. And I'm going to be grateful. And maybe I'll be beyond language. Maybe I won't be kind of, you know, saying rosaries or or saying particular words like thank God for this beautiful day. No, but but I know that the sense of gratefulness is is the same as hunger or thirst. It's like a real clear sensation that you can feel in your conscious mind and in your body mind. I am grateful for this blessing. I rejoice in being here. And in that, I will try sometimes to complete it by a sense of confessing my own imperfections because it's like I am not worthy to be here. Is that negative? No, it's not. It's awakening to what I feel is dark in me. If I, if I wanted to kill a fish and if I used excessive violence and didn't care about it and yet at the same time knew at that moment when I was doing it knew this is wrong this is so wrong I mean I shouldn't be this violent I am a violent person well that's wrong and that again is if you like a wound we like to think of wounds sometimes as, you know, n- n- noble damage inflicted by bad people on us. So that when I say I'm wounded, it's almost like another way of self-aggrandizement, of saying, like, I'm an I wonderful, I'm wounded, I'm a victim. But, but sometimes the deepest wound is in your own self. It is, for me, the deepest wound is like my propensity to maybe be cantankerous or maybe be argumentative or or to have somewhere inside a kind of a forceful anger that in a in a frustrated way as a 16 year old child would batter the shite out of a poor fish a poor helpless fish and a little side of me in the same moment being compassionate to the fish and saying why am I doing this and sometimes the two begin to conflict with each other. I mean, I'll give you a terrible example of that. There was one time. There was one time I got so annoyed with a, a teacher. I was, I was really upset because the teacher, and I won't go into it too much, but I felt ridiculed. And I went home and I, I felt so bad in myself that I went upstairs and I got me teddy bear. And then I went back downstairs, and at the time we had an apple tree in the back garden, and I sat under the apple tree, clutching me little teddy bear. The, the, the only thing in life at that moment that I wanted to feel a tenderness and a communication with. And I cried. And I was so angry at the same time. Angry with what had been said to me by the teacher, but but I had nowhere to go with the anger, so I turned it on the teddy bear. 
And I started pulling the teddy bear apart. I started pulling his ears off. I started pulling his belly out. and I saw the, the kind of the inside. It wasn't foam at the time. It was some sort of a cottony stuff. And it was coming out. And I was looking. And thinking. This is the little teddy bear that I wanted to. I was about, by the way, I was about six at the time now, six or seven. But this is the, the little emblem of all that, to me, represents love and tenderness and that I want to give love to. And I'm actually wounding it. And I was about six or seven at the time. <clears throat> I was about six or seven at the time, but it stays with me, the conflict in that moment, the loneliness in that moment. That on one level I wanted tenderness and the other level I was destroying all possibility of it. I've seen it in other people when they're having a row. So we're complicated, you know. We're complicated creatures. The good that I would do, I don't. And the evil that I wouldn't want to be doing, sometimes I do. And the whole idea of moral good and evil is not really a distinction between, you know, us, the righteous, and all the other people who are out there who are bad. And that's why I keep away from, you know, I totally keep away as much as I can from moralizing about all the various issues in the world that you could be moralizing about. You know, gender wars and culture wars and huge big European wars and Asian wars and just all the the stuff that goes on that that works itself out through history. What's what's working itself out? I suppose it's evil. I mean, funny thing is, we might be iffy about the idea of religion in terms of God, but we're not yet lost to the reality that there is this mystery of evil. And what is my relationship to evil? Well, from my point of view, it's certainly not that the evil is out there and I'm the good. That's not even liberating, you know, because I think that the wound, as I was saying, that Rumi s speaks of and thinks about is not just a wound like a noble wound which you could wear like a badge of honour and say, oh, look, I have been wounded, I am a victim. No, no, the wound, the wound is actually sometimes the damage within me. That's my wound, that's my real wound, is my selfishness, my jealousy, my despondency and despair. And my anger. Those are my wounds. And I need somebody to whom I can confess, to whom I can say, This is something I do. I am sorry. Forgive me. And in terms of Buddhist karma, we are all one single, cosmic, enlightened mind. We transcend ego. And so if I am so committed to my ego that I develop and nourish my dark side, my selfish side, then I am, I am damaging the cosmos. And for that I need to confess. And find forgiveness, by the way. It's finding forgiveness. And there is the path. You can't find forgiveness until you confess. Well, you may notice that I've dealt with half of what's called the seven-limbed prayer. When we come to look at a guru yoga, you know, where you use your mentor deity as the very centre of your your prayer. You visualise the mentor deity, you ask the mentor deity to be present. And then there's 
there's seven limbs to the prayer in the sense that there are seven different attitudes that you nourish in prayer. And I think that they can be used universally no matter what your Christian, Buddhist, Muslim, Hindu, Jewish tradition is. You can approach the mystery of being here now with the seven-limbed prayer. And this morning has been an introduction to that because I've just tried to be personal and biographical and weave into it the power and the wonder and the strength that I get from being grateful, from rejoicing and from recognising the necessity to confess every so often that I'm not perfect. I think they're good therapy as well. I think it's one of the reasons I think it's one of the reasons why prayer life is actually a good therapy. You know, that religion is not juxtaposed to something like psychotherapy for me. Because both are about well-being. And when you get into these kind of skills, if you like the craft of religion, Religion, religion is an art form, a craft. And you begin to de develop the skills in religion, rather than being obsessed with the whole theology, the ideas, you know, about God and Buddha and all this. You get into the practice of it is the practice of prayer. And the practice of prayer is, is the dynamic that allows us to be here now in a lovely way. And that's very close to the well-being that you might be seeking if you were going to a therapist. So both are doing the same thing. And so I feel gratefulness about my life. I feel a sense of rejoicing in this moment, in this present moment. And I feel a sense of seeking your forgiveness. And having those three all the time present to me as emotional dispositions, as, as attitudes to the world around me, they support me in being here now. They, they intensify, they make it easy, they, they open the door into the present moment, each one of those techniques. I'll deal with the other four later and I will then begin to try and weave all of them into the big and beautiful symphony which is what they call Guru Yoga. But I'm going to go slow at it and I'm going to dip them in every so often and I'm going to try and make them like we can all handle them in our memory. You know, I'm not a teacher. I'm not a teacher, I'm not giving a lecture on Buddhism or Christianity, but I'm sharing my story of, of how the dynamic has worked for me and how beneficial it has been. So they're the first three, rejoicing, gratitude and confessing. We look at the other four and then we'll weave the big tapestry and finally what we'll do in this process over the next few months is finally we'll, we'll begin to use them and see how the puja, the prayer, the guru yoga can be used with the Buddha as a mentor deity or with Jesus as a mentor deity or with Mary. Because the, the language differs from religion to religion but the dispositions, the emotional postures the emotional posture, the methodologies whereby the heart opens and where you begin to feel you're in the present moment and grateful for it every second, including in the dark times, that is universal, I think. I think that's human and universal. 
and it is such a joy to be <laughs> sharing it. Sharing it not as a teacher but as a storyteller who struggles from day to day to keep my eyes open. Thank you. Thank you for waiting until Saturday for this one. Thank you for being here. And bye-bye.